Uh, so, in Roman religions, tone had two contradictory features. On one hand, it expressed individuality of people who commissioned uh, its design. The stones with inscriptions were modified in various ways by, for example, carving and uh, cutting both letters and ornaments. The monuments with inscriptions could be also engraved in different types of stone, depending um, on the financial means of a dedicant. On the other hand, stones with inscriptions were placed in uh, public places, um, especially in actually in front of the temples and sanctuaries. So they could be characterized as communal or as objects for admiration or even inspiration. Uh, without stones with inscriptions, the study of religion in the Roman provinces would currently exist. Such a blanket statement is, of course, an exaggeration. Much could still be learned from the rich material remains about sanctuaries, um, iconography, and even cult practices. But apart from a few scattered and um, incidental references in literary sources, you would know almost nothing of the names of the deities uh, worshipped, very little of religious organization, and cult personnel, and far less about key issues such as the um, interaction of local and imperial religious traditions. If you want to know what deities were worshipped in a particular area of uh, Roman provinces, or um, what sorts of people worshipped them, or what religious institutions exist there, epigraphic the stones, evidence, are most uh, important source. The aim of this paper is to present the importance of use of stone in Roman religious practices using the case study of votive inscriptions set up by women, uh, women in the province uh, Dalmatia. It was not only the medium for religious dedication, but also had a symbolic role in Roman society. Votive inscriptions could express, um, as I said, individu individuality of dedicants, uh, religious, but also adherence to the Roman culture. Um, stones are also one of the few categories of finds which allow a um, glimpse into the participation of women in Roman religion. Um, there aren't much evidences that uh, women, especially those who came from Roman provinces, participated in religion life. Um, the majority of known literary sources were written by um, patrician males, about um, patrician males, for surprise, patrician males. <laughs> um, what explains lack of sources concerning women? The marginal role of women's um, participation in religion is strikingly connected to their position in Roman society. They were deprived of many laws who had only men. Moreover, some of Roman authors wrote that um, there existed prohibitions which um, didn't allow women, except of um, price tests, as we can see on this picture, um, drinking wine without water or even cutting raw meat. <laughs> so um, women were excluded from um, making sacrifices. Um, because of women's incapacities and exclusions, founding of inscription was one of the most important ways to express their religiosity in the public space. The study of women and religion attracts attention more and more often, but still there is a very big gap in this research, especially in Eastern Europe Roman provinces. I chose uh, Roman Dalmatia for my research because there was found the highest number of votive uh, Latin inscriptions with the name of women on it among all Roman provinces. Mm. In epigraphic databases, I found circa 130 votive inscriptions, which were set up by a woman um, herself, or by a woman with uh, her, for example, husband or partner, or sometimes father, son, etc. 
Um, moreover, uh, it is the highest number and the bigger proportion between um, all the votive inscriptions in Roman provinces. Uh, as I said, in Dalmatia, uh, it is 130 uh, inscriptions out of um, 900 uh, all of votive inscriptions which were set up only by men. Contrary, in some of other European provinces, for example, in Dacia, we've got uh, 60 uh, set up by women uh, out of uh, circa 1,500. Uh, in Mesia Inferior, it is 31 out of over 500. And in Mesia Superior, it's nearly 20 out of, out of almost um, 400. So we can see the difference. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, it could mean that in Dalmatia, women um, could more actively participate in a public religion. Of course, uh, the number of uh, inscription is not uh, objective. Uh, because of, for example, in Christian times, the pagan inscriptions were frequently used as building material, for example, for city walls, uh, roads, or even churches. Moreover, it's uh, possible, that even it's sure, <laughs> that uh, epigraphic databases online are not um, complete. So for being objective and for getting more uh, information, for example, for um, types of stone, etc., it is necessary to search uh, all of corpora with inscriptions and archaeological reports from present territory of Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, Kosovo, Serbia and Albania. So it's my plan for next one year or two years. <laughs> I'll see. Um, what is also interesting for my research, uh, Dalmatia is the most um, diversified ethnically Roman uh, province, uh, even after Roman conquest was interesting. Um, the picture uh, which has uh, emerged from the detailed studies of such important scholar like Geza Alfeldi suggests the following distinct ethnic and geographical groupings, the Iapodes, the Liburni, the Delmate, the Pannonias in northern Dalmatia, the people of eastern Dalmatia and some Celtic people from each part of the province. All of these tribes had their own religious system, what means that um, if some, for example, uh, Liburnian women uh, worshipped uh, Roman deities by setting camp for them an inscription, that means uh, she expressed in some way her adherence to the Roman world and to the Roman culture. Uh, most of our data about divine names comes from votive inscriptions, which are by far the most common type of uh, inscription that concerns religious life in the provinces. Uh, as already suggested, stones with votive inscription can tell us um, stories not only about gods, but also about their worshippers. Uh, inscription, even those of pure quality cost money and were consequently beyond the means of most people. Moreover, the practice of uh, inscribing dedications of stone was to a large extent a distinctly Roman one. Most provincials who erected dedicatory inscriptions were thus adopting a Greco-Roman um, cutting practice, uh, whether consciously or not. We must accordingly be aware that, for both reasons, the data provided by dedicatory inscriptions concern a particular segment of the population. Nevertheless, the information that we mm, can derive from them is a sort uh, that would otherwise be completely unavailable. Um, from a name, we can normally determine the dedicator's gender and uh, occasionally something about his or her social status and cultural background as well. Uh, whether the dedicator was uh, ingenuous or immigrant, citizen or peregrine. For example, um, among all of women, there were, among others, um, freed women were identified by liberation, it is um, liberta in Latin, uh, by naming uh, or not, it is a faculty thing, 
their uh, ex patronus uh, or ex owner and this is sometimes called um, pseudo filiation or parts filiation because in other inscriptions um, frequently um, behind the name of the woman there is a name <coughs> of her father so it's something like this and here we deal with two cases uh, it's uh, Dharmaka Secunda and Trosia uh, Prima um, this uh, first of the inscription came from uh, Bribir, second one from Benkovac, and both are dated to 1st and 2nd century AD. Uh, contrary to freed women, there's a quite numerous group of women who set up um, inscriptions only by their own. We can suppose that they had enough money for it, so mm -hmm. they had probably a higher social status. In Dalmatia, um, there is much more inscriptions set up only by women than in other European provinces. In my future research, I would like to create um, a map of all votive inscriptions from Dalmatia to analyze if there are some connections between uh, dedicant and the ethnic group which they belong to. <coughs> because I've heard some rumors from uh, ancient sources and that in Liburnia women um, had more power than in the other ethnic groups. So I'd like to check there if it's true or not. And here, in the first um, example, uh, we deal with uh, Junia Varena, who founded the altar for uh, Juno. And in the second case, inscription was founded by um, Cornelia Tertia, who was uh, Caius' um, daughter. And she worshipped in this altar uh, Jupiter Optimus Maximus. And we also can see that um, the style of letter is not good, the line is blurred, and yeah, so the quality isn't very well. Um, what is my opinion, the most interesting, but unfortunately very rare, is a personal experience of a dedicant. Among all mm, the inscriptions set up by women, there's only one with this case as well. A freed woman whose name was Julia Maxima and who lived in ancient Salona in 1st or 2nd century AD founded the inscription to Liber Pater as the result of something having been seen. It's um, ex viso in Latin. Uh, it could be an evidence that she had some um, specific individual religious experiences uh, connected directly with contact with God, for example, in a dream. I think that the other options isn't possible. Or maybe <laughs> you can be sure. <laughs> um, among other gods who were mentioned in the inscriptions were, for example, uh, Roma Augusta, Isis, Magna Mater, and uh, Silvanus. So not only the deities worship only by women, like, for example, Venus. And what's interesting about Silvanus, uh, this god is subject to special attention from the archaeologists from former Yugoslavia who considered him to be a dual deity distinguishing a Roman god when mentioned in inscriptions from a local deity on representations such um, as when on this slide a clear underestimation of the complexities of religious and ethnic identities in antiquity but uh, generally, hmm. for now, um, the researchers think that it's not true. And it's only um, some kind of uh, provincial style and not their incapacity for uh, sculpture, something which is really beautiful. Uh, I haven't <coughs> analyzed all the inscriptions yet, but for um, this moment it's possible to say that the altars and plaques founded <coughs> by women from Roman Dalmatia uh, aren't high and uh, unfortunately, um, as we can see, it haven't got many decorations. You can see only the lines and letters and yeah, something like that. Um, so hmm, for now it's hard to say something about uh, individuality. Uh, the high achieved from 25 to 61 centimeters. Moreover, often the quality <laughs> of letters on inscriptions is uh, not good. 
Um, and here's another example. And the most number of inscriptions was made in the same type of stone, so it's uh, limestone, which was the most cheaper and most available material. But there are some single examples were made in sandstone and marble. For some toppings, stones with inscriptions provide a crucial or even sole source of evidence. The variety of gods and the extent of their worship, the number and social location of their worshippers. Less obviously, inscriptions can also provide valuable insight into cultural assumptions about the nature of the gods and their interactions with mortals, and can help us explore, if not resolve, issues of cultural and religious identity. The most important is, of course, the material. Stone is not only the most durable material known in Roman times, it is also a symbol of Roman culture, which can tell us a lot of very interesting stories. Thank you for your attention.